scorn, scorn, scorn. Do you remember Romania? I wouldn't blame anyone who, over the eight years since this incredible late kick by Florin Vleku, started a hideous Canadian spiral and sent the Oaks home from England on a high, has kind of forgotten about the Romanian national rugby team. A nation that was one-time European standouts and a treat to witness at World Cups had become an ageing team in decline, embroiled in scandal, kicked out of the 2019 tournament right after qualifying and starting to give up results to much less storied rugby nations, so many of whose stock was growing at their expense. Georgia were Europe's seventh force now, and the shithouse novelty Russia side replaced them at the 2019 showpiece. And since Romania last graced the World Cup, we've seen the sudden emergence or rebirth of Uruguay, Chile, Spain, Portugal. Romania had retreated into the shadows. Indeed, when Andy Robinson, the only man to coach both England and Scotland, and an equal punchline in both nations, was named their new head coach, it didn't even raise enough of a reaction to get a snigger on Twitter. Note to the world, Romanian rugby had disappeared. And yet, it is now 2023 and a resurgent Romania are gearing up for one of their biggest years ever. Because 2023 is the year Romania remind the world who they are. Ah, so what happened to the Oaks, Romania? How did they strike back? And just how excited should we be to see the Oaks back in France this coming autumn? Rugby first arrived in Romania when a group of rowdy students returned home from an exchange trip to Paris with eyes widened into ovals and elongated pigskins tucked under their arms, feeling they just discovered the most glorious, wonderful, exciting new game. This sect of students quickly taught their classmates and rugby exploded like wildfire across the capital city. Schools, colleges, tennis, clubs, even specially formed RFCs, all corners of Bucharest taking up this gloriously brutal, skillful French pastime. Until, sure enough, in 1914, Liga Nationale de Rugby was founded, one of only five leagues in the world older than Alan Wynne Jones. Still running today, the league trophy was initially contested between just two teams who played each other over and over again, but inside 10 years there were 19 clubs, all from Bucharest, contesting for that title. It wasn't until 1939, the 24th competition, that they welcomed a team from outside the capital to their biggest league. This concentration on Bucharest is a tradition that, frankly, exists still to this day in Romanian rugby. Of the 27 players in Romania's present-day squad, based in that proud, old, now semi-professional league, 21 are at clubs in the capital. And indeed, this national team was the next innovation. In 1919, a 15 made up of members of the Romanian military took part in a freeway round robin with the national teams from France and the USA. And when they got home, they went, hold on, what if we let people who weren't soldiers take part? Romania played as an open, proper test nation for the first time against France again in the opening match of the 1924 Olympics, the last Olympiad to ever include 15 aside rugby union. The French actually only inviting Romania to Paris because they were considering a breakaway competition to rival a new five nations starting their own competition and wanted to test out the opposition. France won 15-9-3 and decided revolutions are no fun if the heads come off without too much resistance. And so ended the only chance to step up the tears Romania would ever be given after their very first game. However, one group did see potential where France could not. The team returned home from Paris with a bronze medal, a title they technically still hold. They're still bronze medal Olympic team. And in a classic, rugby values, isn't this sport different? And morals mean we're nothing like other sports. We're so much, so much better and more moral people. The fascist Soviet-occupied government saw rugby as a perfect tool to spread propaganda disguised as national pride. They went heavy on promoting rugby and the sport grew enormously across the country. It exploded. And I mean exploded. I'm not exaggerating. This reached a peak in 1957. Participation rates were high, but interest in the sport was astronomic. That May, 95,000 people packed into their national stadium like fish fingers into Tig Furlong to watch the Oaks take on France in Bucharest. This was a world record crowd at the time and still stands as the fifth biggest crowd at a rugby match ever. Romania lost... 1518, but it captured the world's imagination. Romania opened up to rugby, and the sport opened up to Romania. They started getting bigger games, more frequent fixtures, and most notably, a rematch against France three years later. A game Romania went on to win. Romania then beat them again in 1962, and then again in 1968. It's a chapter of rugby history that's largely been relegated to a footnote, but in the 1970s, Romania were 
incredible. They beat Italy 69-0. Very nice. They were turning over France regularly. They secured a draw against the Junior All Blacks, their second 15 at the time. And as they hit the 80s, the Oaks only got stronger. They drew with Ireland at Lansdowne Road. They crushed Wales 24-6. Then beat them again 15-9. They decimated France 15-0 and defeat the Grand Slam Scotland team. I think that's the first time I've ever said that sentence. And then, controversially, fell just short of the crown jewel on top of it all. In 1981, Romania had two heavily disputed tries disallowed that would have seen them beat the mighty All Blacks in front of another packed, enormous, rammed, sold-out Bucharest crowd. Romania, in the 80s, were a force. There were no world rankings back then, but you could safely put them into maybe the top eight type position. And they maintained that for nearly a decade. And yet the recognition they begged for, the seat at the table they wanted so badly, never came. The nation's highly complicated political situation is often used as a very reasonable excuse for why this never came. But dig into almost any point in rugby history and we'll be battered over the head by shitty things the IOB did to prevent the game growing beyond their pathetic club of posh boys and Taylor Blazers and the decision to ignore Romania and refuse them not just a place in the expanded five nations, but a single vote, a single voice on the world's governing body council, even after the 1989 revolution is right up there. If you forgot about Romanian rugby at any stage over the last few years, you can point a finger ultimately back to the superiority complex bollocks that kept Romania in the cold all the way back in the 80s and 90s because a few wealth tossers didn't think these Eastern Europeans were the right sort to welcome the club. Romania didn't gain a voice on the World Rugby Council until 2016, right after competing in their 8th World Cup. Their first World Cup, however, came a few years too late, perhaps, for their now ageing superstar squad. National treasures such as wing-slash-TV personality Manuel Todir and legendary scrum half Miroshea Parashev were starting to show their age. Even the marauding, glorious, recklessly violent, some of my favourite rugby players to watch, to go back and watch from the 80s, glorious, glorious Constantine brothers, couldn't help them to any more than the win over Zimbabwe. But it was 1991, however, that was the real heartbreaker. In the 18 months before the competition, a rebuilt Romania had defeated France, Italy, and a Grand Slam Scottish side. I've said that again. I've never said it before in my life, but I've said it twice in a very short period of time. But come the big dance. France blew them away. Canada held on to beat them, and a big win over Fiji left them wondering what could have been. A better start against the Maple Leaf Gang, and Romania might have just made their first ever World Cup quarterfinal. But instead, the rot the IOB had encouraged started to set in. Romania's results from 1995 onwards took a tumble. The margins against the big boys started to grow. The teams they were competing against a cycle ago now blowing them away until scrappy wins over Namibia and the USA were all they had to cling to. And then, down the line, something magical happened. In 2005, a Romania under-20s team entered the Junior World Cup as bottom seeds. And after a strong opening win over Japan, they went on to push Scotland to within one point, beat Argentina and give France a proper game. And in the process, gave birth to a genuine golden generation of new stars. That June, the team's star winger Catalan Thurku would go on to make his international debut. And for the next 154 consecutive games... For 16 years in a row, every single 15 the Romanian national rugby team fielded would include at least one player from that historic age grade group. Not only would Furku go on to become his nation's all-time top try scorer, the group also included Florin Vleku, the only tier 2 player to ever score 1,000 points in international rugby. Mihai Makave, a 100 cap international who was sensational in the 2015 World Cup and capped in the Oaks more than 70 times and is still going. Mihita Lazar, an exceptional prop forward who destroyed Scotland in 2011 and was the cornerstone of a top 14 winning cast team. Valentin Popolan, a favourite here at Squidge Towers for the time he accidentally scored a try without realising it during the 2015 World Cup. The side may not have pulled off any big wins over tier 1 nations but my god they came close. Romania should have beaten Scotland in 2011 but for a late Simon Danielli try. They could have beaten Italy in 2007 but for one stupid old error in their own 22 and then they gave them a game again in 2015 and so one week before their most recent World Cup game as two tries from McAvey and this incredible late kick by Vleku netted Romania a huge win over a much hyped up Canada team taking revenge for that fateful day in 1991. However, this exceptional core soon became a crutch. 
Andy Robinson's move to Romania was announced whilst the 2019 World Cup was still going on in the classic, well, we didn't want to go to your party anyway move. And his first campaign in February 2020 very much felt like a stock take, selecting a side stuffed to the Jerry's Pizza crust with experienced older heads. However, once the team emerged from a pandemic and forced shutdown that June, the changes had started to take place already. The age profile got very notably younger very quickly. Of those rugby's pensioners, only McAvey has remained, the 36-year-old retaining the captaincy in the team otherwise bright-eyed and with at least a little bit of bush in the tail, and we start to see an emphasis shift as well. With defenders as good as they are nowadays, Romania needed ways to stay in the game, especially with a young team learning test rugby, and so Robinson assessed very smartly. The Oaks put their stock in two tactics. The Maul, developing maybe the most fierce and big lad shove game in Tier 2 rugby. Two thirds of tries in Romania's 2021 wins came from their Maul. It's a huge weapon for them, and there's something beautiful about how messy their setup is. This isn't a Springbok style sleek beast Maul. Romania, like their Mauls, wide to prevent anyone lurking around it, whilst this fellow in the middle assesses the options and can call for a peel left or right and a break off wherever he sees it. It's rare that Romania's mall tries are straight up muscle jobs going A to B in a straight line. They're usually utilising the wonderfully messy setup to confuse the defence. Nobody knows where the ball is going to end up when the bodies are all over the place like this. And then, a few months later, that younger squad and that messy mall so almost gave the Oaks their greatest moments as Jonah Lomu left diapers as a fully loaded Los Pumas rocked up. To Bucharest. Romania under Robinson largely played the same game he deployed with Scotland. Romania weren't a kicking team, but a chasing team. They hounded everything. No breakdown was ever a lost cause, and every time ball hit boot or loose pass came, it became less defence and more a hunt. And how able and eager players such as Bobak here are to chase this gives them an early lead against Argentina in that game. In trying to build a new identity, Robinson very much rediscovered and reinvigorated the same spirit and tactics that worked so well for Romania 40, 50 years ago. Where the 80s Oaks would beat a free-flowing French team without scoring a try, contemporary Romania were able to keep in touch against Argentina and even defeat fellow World Cup nations like Uruguay and Chile by taking the points. Goal-kicking fullback Yenel Malinte is in and out of the team a bit, but he's an absolute metronome of goal-kicker. Romania attacked Argentina with a kind of old-school physicality that has very little reply. It's a weird game to analyse this, going back over it, because it's a match mostly played in the 222s. Both sides pressure-kicking game, pinning the other back, and resulting in the Oaks reaching the 73rd minute, scores level, only eventually undone with mere minutes to go by a moment of utter magic by Santiago Cordero. Who else? Putting Juan Martin Gonzalez... But who else? Over for an ultimately spectacular score. And in their other tier one test of the cycle against Italy last year, they put up a similar fight, leading on the stroke of half time, only for two tries in the final two plays of the half to snap their spirits a little bit going into that second period. Yet both those tests highlighted that their resolve just never seems to break. They kept coming at Italy, eventually scoring in the final play and holding strong in defence a few times when they really shouldn't. And this was the situation against Argentina, a mall getting them right up the try line, hunting for an equaliser with moments left in the match, only for the mess that is their mall to work against them, a truck and trailer penalty costing them a shot at history. And you wouldn't have blamed Romania fans for feeling that sinking, slipping away feeling again in December, as seemingly, out of absolutely nowhere, Andy Robinson terminated his contract. He said it was down to results, but nobody seems quite sure exactly why it was a huge shock. Yet Romania had to act quickly with a World Cup on the horizon. And so, in his place, came a man named Eugene Apshock, a coach who, you probably didn't know this, is actually the most successful coach in professional rugby history. A free cap fly half who retired the very year Romania decided to professionalise that setup, his lifelong club, Bayer Marie, got themselves into a bit of a pickle in 2003. This affiliated by the union for various financial disputes that are really hard to understand when you don't speak Romanian and then relegated down two divisions at once. Apjok took over as head coach and not just did he get his club immediately back up to the big boy league with back-to-back promotions, but he kept building from there. For after just three years back in the top league, Apjok took his hometown team to the promised land. Three back-to-back Liga Nacionale titles. Only the second team from outside Bucharest to win it since the 80s. He had a brief stint as national backs coach for the 2015 World Cup then, before returning to his beloved Bayer Marie a few years later, where he would pull him out of another rut, having fallen off enormously since he left, to win four more league titles and any number of Romanian Cups. His 24 Four national or pan-European trophies takes Apshock past Gino Vez's 14 and Mark McCall's 11 to make him the most successful coach in any professionalised 
rugby league ever, to the best of my knowledge, as best as I could find. And in 2023, he finally got his chance to coach his national team as the big dog. And, you know, it didn't go quite according to plan so far, but hey, he's a great coach, he'll turn it around. If Romania chopped and changed a lot under Robinson, and trust me, I spent a long time going over their team sheets, they bloody did, that went double when Apshock was given just eight games to prepare for a crucial, crucial World Cup campaign. Romania have now changed their starting fly half for 12 games in a row, with seven different players sharing that shirt. Florin Popper and Tudor Baldor, with three and two stars respectively, are the only pair to wear the 10 jersey multiple times over the last year. Maybe the coaches got confused that Pop, Popper, Yarala and Popper are three different players, but it's led to a bit of bafflement in Romania's play. After general uptick in results and performances, this year was a bit all over the place. Big wins over Poland and Belgium were, you know, lovely, very nice. When thrown into a huge game against Portugal, essentially deciding second place in this year's championship to Georgia, they, well... Are you ready to see some really good defence? Pedro Betancourt here scores a try for Portugal by doing a shit clear out, knocking the ball loose over the line and diving on it. Since Apshok entered, Romani's attack has almost overnight gone up a couple of gears. They frankly look much more fluid, open and willing to take risks than they ever did under Robinson, who was far more conservative. Leading to moments such as this glorious bit of skill from up and coming 10, Gabriel Pop, hugely talented young player. Finished by his fellow Gabriel Scrumarf Rupanu, who has wrestled the nine jersey in the last few years off a hundred cap veteran Florian Vlaku, who the romantic Romanian people will remember weeping his way through the 2015 World Cup. However, since Robinson's exit, a little bit of the steel that starts to define Romania to really come back into the game has rusted. The tries they're conceding have started to get a bit softer and softer over the course of this European Championship as it went on. Some of this will be teething problems with a new coach that can be sorted out, and a D is actually now led by former France defence coach Dave Ellis, who did a pretty great job with France in his time. But these changes in philosophy in both attack and defence threatens to, yes, make their match against South Africa all the scarier, but their fixture against Tonga even more mouth-watering. Robinson's Romania lost 22-0 to Samoa last year in a really hard-fought battle, where they were within it for most of the game, but Apshock's side might look to open up a bit more against this South Sea Island foe this year. Because Romania do have some really talented players to lean on. Legendary captain Mihai Makovic is still going at the grand old age of 36 and is to Romani what Sergio Parise is to Italy or Muka Kukodze to Georgia. An utter workhorse who is looking for a great send-off that boy does he deserve. But he's likely to be partnered in the back row by maybe the most exciting of the fresh crop of World Cup debutante Romanians. I'm talking about Christy Chirica, an unbelievable ball carrier. What makes Chirica such a danger isn't his raw power, but an utter unwillingness to ever die in contact. He never accepts a tackle and always fights for an extra inch after even the hardest of hits. This finish against Uruguay last year was simply unbelievable. It's like watching Joshua Tuasova or a prime George North, but it's a Romanian number eight. And without the ball, he's equally excellent. A hard hitter, but his eight foot arms also come in handy to regain the ball when making reads like this against Spain his elongated yellow body also containing the pace to finish it himself. Sharika scored five tries in five games in this year's Rugby Europe Championship, and if the Oaks are to make a mark on this year's World Cup, expect Christy Sharika to cause a few bruises, and maybe a few shouts of your Rika. Those bruises are something he'll probably have in common with their absolutely enormous front row. Alexandru Salvin is a superb loose head, but former Moldova and Ospreys prop and walking pair of shoulders, Georgi Garjon, has been an absolute revelation for the Oaks this last year, his tank with arms physique being put to very fine use at scrum time. Behind the scrum, however, utility back and full-on baller, Hinkley Valvassa has an utter touch of class about him, he's gorgeous to watch, and after eight years in the top 14 floating around the French leagues, former Clermont and Toulon wing centre Attila Septar declared for Romania last autumn and consistently shine since, while centre Taylor Gontaniak is a really exciting prospect who ties Romania to that glorious past. For his father, Romeo Gontaniak is a former captain and legend of the game in Romania who played every single game for the Oaks across four World Cup campaigns in 95, 99, 03 and then 
7. And his son has more than picked up where his father left off the last time the World Cup was in France. Gonteniak Jr. currently stands at 6 tries and 7 caps for Romania. The highlight being this unbelievable carry in the first minute against Portugal, which he goes on to finish himself. He's such a weapon that may fly under the radar and may cause some actual damage for a few teams in that pool, especially if him and Valvassa get the chance to link up in midfield. We may see a fair few treats coming from the Oaks. Because for all the decades of heartbreak and bullshit, Romania are headed to France, knowing they need to banish the memories of not just the bad times of their disqualification and their time in the wilderness, but the memories of the good as well. Reinvention is the target. Embrace the past, yes, but move forward and lay down the foundations for a future where we won't be able to forget them so quickly ever again. Thank you for watching that. I hope you enjoyed it. A huge thank you in particular to Retro Rugby Romania, a channel on YouTube that was an absolute goldmine for being able to actually find footage of Romania winning games in the 70s and 80s. Thank you enormously there. Thank you for watching that. There's going to be one of these videos. The aim is to do every team in the World Cup. There's some more coming up very soon, including some big boys that are uh, large. So we'll see you then for that. Until then, have a lovely um, week and enjoy the rugby. The big man, Stefan Constantin, here he is shrugging away the, the tackles. You wouldn't believe this man is a lock forward. Look at the way that he's moving. And he's got a sidestep as well. Over the 22, the support was there. Twada, his hands.